Well, good evening, and welcome to this session uh, from Pathways to PROs. I'm Stanley Cohen um, from Dallas, Texas, a rheumatologist from Dallas, Texas, and I'm very happy to be up here with my good friend uh, Lynn Calabrese, uh, who I think everyone knows and has been a major source of information to us in the world of viruses and so forth for many years. Uh, what we're really going to make an effort to do tonight is to review a lot of the data with the uh, Jack and Nibs, and uh, both a little bit of preclinical data that we do with some fear, but uh, certainly the clinical data. And uh, so we're going to talk about, uh, you know, what we know about the mechanism of action of Jack inhibitors and how that might impact clinical decision makings. So without further ado, we're going to get started. We're going to try to make this informal. Lynn can disagree with me, or, uh, and we're going to split up the slides somehow, which we haven't quite yet figured out. Uh, but let's. Uh, we, also, we also have a role reversal that I wore a tie, and Dr. Cohen did not wear a tie. And I, I haven't, got, this out and I haven't gotten over that fact yet. I've never I was seen Lynn in keep up. Right. So uh, let's talk about uh, signal transduction. Uh, the, their protein tyrosine kinases facilitate signal transduction, of which uh, there are 90 have been identified. And there's some very famous receptor PTKs, such as epidermal growth factor receptor, platelet derived growth factor. There are a number of non-receptor uh, protein tyrosine kinases, including the uh, Janus kinases, spleen tyrosine kinases, and actually the P38 MAP kinases. Uh, and uh, there's been significant experience with these kinase inhibitors in oncology. And for many years, I've been involved in uh, clinical drug development since 1980. And we would go around and talk to people and say the holy grail would be to find a small molecule, an oral um, administered pill that was as effective as biologics. And we spent about 10 years, uh, if not longer, looking at various P38 MAP kinase inhibitors, which were not effective and also had toxicity. And we also uh, had some poor experience with spleen tyrosine kinases uh, previously. So uh, these are the FDA-approved PTK inhibitors uh, in oncology. And you can see as, uh, that there are many of these that are approved. Uh, and uh, they were far ahead, from, ahead of us, but they also helped us better understand the safety profile uh, of these molecules and uh, paved the way for our uh, understanding these and also becoming more comfortable uh, with these PTK inhibitors. So just as a background, uh, what we're showing here is uh, the uh, type 1 and type 2 cytokine signaling. Uh, this is not TNF-alpha, this is not IL-1. Uh, these are multiple cytokines, which we'll show in uh, subsequent slides. But uh, again, when the cytokines bind to their transmembrane, re transmembrane receptors, uh, these receptors are associated with particular Janus kinases. And when the um, cytokine binds to the receptor, these uh, Janus kinases are upregulated. Uh, uh, ja JAKs phosphorylate the receptors. Uh, they also phosphorylate uh, STAT molecules, uh, which bind to these receptors, and uh, this JAK-STAT pathway, which has been well delineated, results in signal transduction to the nucleus and then a transcription of inflammatory proteins. Uh, the JAKs uh, use ATP uh, for this autophosphorylation. Uh, basically, um, let's see if this uh, pointer works. So this is the JAK molecule here, and uh, basically cleaving a phosphorus group from ATP uh, to activate uh, the receptor or the STAT molecules. Uh, the JAK inhibs fit into this cleft here and block the ability of this transfer of a phosphate molecule, and that's uh, how these uh, downregulate signal transduction. It's a complicated system uh, in that uh, uh, there are different pathways for different cytokines, and uh, the JAKs uh, facilitate signal transduction in pairs. So, for example, uh, shown here is JAK1 and JAK3 uh, facilitating signal transduction through the receptor containing the common gamma chain, which is IL-2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21. And it associates with particular STAT molecules, and that's uh, been well delineated and, and also used in some of the assays to look at preferential JAK inhibition. So JAK3 is uh, very important for lymphocyte proliferation and homeostasis and is really found only in hematopoietic cells. Uh, JAK3 knockouts have the phenotype of uh, 
uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. JAK1 and JAK2 knockouts are lethally, embryonically lethal and uh, uh, certainly uh, not what we want to see by total knockout of these uh, JAKs. But again, as you go through here, there's different cytokines which use different JAK molecules in TIC2. There's JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, and TIC2. Uh, importantly, um, you have type 1 interferons over here signaling through JAK1 and TIC2, and that's uh, led to a lot of interest in these molecules being looked at in lupus uh, with downregulation of type 1 interferons. Very importantly for rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, IL-6 uh, uh, will signal through JAK1 as well as JAK1, JAK2, JAK1, TIC2. Uh, what we don't want to downregulate for prolonged periods of time is uh, the JAK2 combination where both JAK2s help signal transduction. This is where erythropoietin, thrombopoietin, uh, GMCSF signal through this receptor and this could lead to untoward side effects of severe anemia, leukopenia, and so forth. And John O'Shea, who's done the seminal work in this field for the last 20 years, would have said uh, many years ago that um, uh, if you had a JAK persistent JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor, persistent JAK2 inhibitor, it would never be viable. It would be too toxic to the patients. But we now know that um, you can develop a molecule that blocks uh, these particular JAKs. And it has partially to do with the fact that you're not blocking these JAKs for 24 hours. When you're giving these therapies, you have on-off periods of time or sort of what a drug holiday within 24 hours. So that seems to have been effective in reducing uh, the toxicity that could potentially occur with prolonged suppression. So this is just another depiction, a little clearer. Uh, again, there's four JAK family members as shown here. There are seven STAT members. And shown here are the particular cytokines which signal through these particular uh, JAK pairs. So at this meeting, there's been a tremendous amount of data uh, presented for the approved JAK inhibitors for rheumatoid arthritis and then those that are in development. And this is just a summary uh, of uh, the JAK inhibitors that we have. Tofacitinib that was approved in 2012. Uh, baricitinib, which was approved earlier this year, uh, and it, which is a JAK1-2 inhibitor. Upadacitinib, which we saw many uh, abstracts presented at this meeting. Uh, Filgotinib, uh, beginning to roll out uh, their Phase three data after presenting their previous Phase two data. Pefacitinib data was presented by Dr. Tan uh, Tanaka from Japan. Uh, and uh, it looks like development is continuing in Asia, but not in North America and then a previously discontinued JAK3 dersinidinib. So just, in the, just over here, just so you know, there are very active clinical programs ongoing in multiple other diseases. So we're going to see what the concept of epitope spreading to other diseases based on our understanding of the various cytokines that are inhibited. There's uh, other JAK inhibitors not shown here that are far down the pike with atopic dermatitis with uh, uh, sounds like, from what I can understand, very interesting data. So uh, a lot of potential indications um, uh, for these JAK inhibitors. Now, again, we do show this slide with some trepidation. Uh, I put this together so Lenny's off the hook with this one. Uh, but this is looking at the little bit of difference in PK and PD of the JAK inhibitors that are on the market and in the development. It was had to get the data from the public domain, so some of this is sketchy, but there are you know, clearly differences in the Tmax. Uh, Filgotinib, just so you know, is a prodrug. It's metabolized, and its uh, metabolite has a much longer half-life and greater exposure. Uh, there are some differences in metabolism uh, with uh, these three JAK inhibitors using the cytochrome P450 system, which leads to some concerns about certain drugs like the itraconazole, ketoconazole, and rifampin. And there's some differences as far as excretions and the need or in, and metabolism and the need to modify your dose in situations where you have patients with significant renal insufficiency or underlying hepatic disease. There have been a number of preclinical studies done uh, looking at uh, the specificity of the JAK inhibitors. And there are these assays which are a little bit above my pay grade. But uh, there are these enzymatic assays, or so-called uh, biochemical assays, looking at the ability of these JAK inhibitors to preferentially inhibit JAK1, JAK2, or JAK3, or TIC2, 
And there are these whole blood assays stimulating monocytes to make cytokines and trying to inhibit um, their production. And just for example, take baricitinib. You can see baricitinib has a, these very few nanomoles concentration to inhibit JAK1 and JAK2, much more for JAK3 and somewhat more for TIC2. You can see uh, the same concept for JAK1 for fogotinib, uh, and uh, tofacitinib is actually more of a pan-JAK inhibitor, but you can see fewer nanomoles in this experiment for JAK1. There are issues with these assays. It depends on uh, how much ATP you add to an assay. There, these things can be modified. So it's uh, not clear what the clinical perspective of these molecules, is, of, the, of this data, is going to be. Uh, I know that the FDA, in their briefing documents, uh, has stated that tofacitinib and baricitinib are pan-JAK inhibitors in their, in their uh, viewpoint. Uh, we'll see what um, the ultimate consensus is by the regulatory agencies for filgotinib and upadacitinib, uh, but clearly there is data that's suggesting there is differential JAK inhibition, and as we've heard throughout this meeting from John O'Shea and others, you know, how that translates into clinical efficacy, which we're seeing, is still unclear. So it may be too early in the game. We don't have sophisticated enough preclinical evaluation to really have a good understanding of how the selectivity will play out. I'd like to just embellish that for a second. I think that, uh, you know, we, we now have a kind of a linear understanding of JAK stat signaling, and we're trying to um, come up with a, a, a simple kind of algorithmic approach to understand these, like this, this inhibits this and this inhibits that. In actuality, as everyone uh, recognizes, uh, and almost uh, consistent with everything in immunology, the, 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 it's far more complicated issue. If you just think about it this way, uh, you only have seven stats, uh, yet in a combinatorial fashion, the same stats are transducing the signal of over 50 different cytokines. And we don't really understand the nuances of, of how this happens, uh, for number one. Secondly, um, each cytokine um, will activate multiple jacks uh, and multiple stats. So how that signal is ultimately refined uh, is unclear. Uh, jack signaling in vivo, um, does, it's not an off and on phenomena within the cell. It occurs in waves. Uh, and there's a biphasic um, activation thing that is very difficult to reduplicate in any kind of these uh, ex vivo um, uh, assays. And then furthermore, when jacks are activated, there are other biologic processes going on uh, 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 other than phosphorylation events. These are enzymes, and uh, they're ubiquinated and uh, undergo uh, uh, sumulation and, and other processes um, uh, that we are not even taking into account when we're doing uh, these assays, which are, are done on phosphate-based things. So, you know, I, I think we all have a lot to learn uh, in this area, and, you know, as much as we want a simple uh, uh, answer, uh, we're, we're going to have to keep our eyes open. All right, that's a great insight. So, um, Lenny's going to do all the hard work at the end of tonight, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, look at the, some of the data that's available. I'm a, I, as me, some of you may know, I'm a clinical trialist, and basically this is what I do, uh, these, doing these studies and, and, and evaluating the data. So let's take a look at uh, the efficacy and safety, although, Lynn, it is an audience response question. That's right. So audience response question number one. So on the existential scale of your familiarity with the efficacy and safety for emerging JAK inhibitors, not just the ones we have. Just break it down uh, that uh, you're the 0 to 25 or 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or you're John O'Shea's distant <laughs> cousin. <laughs> or very familiar. So we'll start with the oldest uh, jackanib on the market, and that's uh, tofacitinib. And you'll see that uh, all of the uh, various JAK inhibitors have had a very similar development program. And, uh, you know, they did large phase three studies in patients on background methotrexate, what we call methotrexate incomplete responders, or background uh, conventional synthetic DMARDs, and usually those studies have 80% of people on methotrexate. Uh, 
they did an active controlled study with adalimumab, the standard study. They did their x-ray outcomes, and then they did TNF failures, and they did a monotherapy uh, study. And there's worlds of data, but just the, the 40,000 foot view, this is on the x-axis or the various phase three studies we just mentioned, the y-axis, the ACR 50% response, and you have this placebo response here, and looks to me to be maybe gray or brown, I'm a little colorblind, light blue five milligram BID, the approved dose, and the 10 milligram BID dose, which is not approved in, in North America. And here in red is adalimumab as the active comparator. And what you see, and similar to Delta DAS or ACR2070, low disease activity, remission, that tofacitinib 5 milligram BID and 10 milligram BID were superior uh, to placebo. Uh, we have felt it very important in the past, and many of you still may feel it very important to show that you prevent x ray progression. I frankly hope we never see another x ray study in a phase three clinical trial because uh, they're so expensive. And when you have a change in placebo of 0.47 on a scale of 440, I'm not sure what that means. But the bottom line in the, uh, the higher dose, 10 milligram BID, was statistically different from placebo. Uh, the 5 milligram dose did not achieve statistical difference in the initial methotrexate IR study. But in the early RA trial, looking at methotrexate versus tofacitinib, tofacitinib was, uh, did prevent radiographic progression and ultimately got that claim uh, from the regulatory agencies. Uh, Baricitinib, pretty much an identical program. Looking at uh, uh, data we're not going to show tonight. Did we move? You go just back. Peaked up. There we go. Um, showed, uh, they did look at early RA, and then they had the methotrexate. Uh, I'm not doing that, Len, I'm telling you. Uh, and then the methotrexate incomplete responders, conventional synthetic DMR incomplete responders. You must be. I guess on. they want that data to show. Someone here from Barrison? No. no. <laughs> so, uh, nevertheless, it was the similar study design. And these are the ACR50 responses, uh, looking at uh, placebo, uh, baricitinib uh, at uh, 2 milligrams here, baricitinib at 4 milligrams, 2 milligrams is the approved dose, and TNF incomplete responders, uh, compl compared to methotrexate incomplete responder in the methotrexate incomplete responder population, or the TNF IR uh, population. And you can see that, again, uh, looking at ACR50 responses, statistically superior and clinically different. And then here, looking at the RA beam, methotrexate incomplete responders, comparing uh, the 4 milligram dose of baricitinib to the adalimumab, uh, 40 milligrams every 14 days in usual fashion. Uh, it was um, uh, st statistically superior in favor of baricitinib over adalimumab in this group. Again, looking at the radiographic outcomes, uh, what you can see here is that looking at the probability plot, and as you know from all the studies that we've seen, it's about 20% of the patients, maybe 30%, that drive the x-ray difference here. Uh, you can see that the adalimumab group and baricitinib group overlap, and the group that continued on placebo with background methotrexate had more radiographic damage, so demonstrating, again, a true disease-modifying effect. Upadacitinib, their phase three program, you could overlap with the other two. <coughs> Uh, we're going to show you some snippets of uh, their data, much of which was presented here at this meeting on Sunday. Uh, this is an interesting study design taking people who were on methotrexate uh, with active disease and um, basically continuing methotrexate or discontinuing methotrexate and continuing and just using upadacitinib 15 milligrams or 30 milligrams with the primary endpoint of week 14 of ACR20 for to, to appease the US FDA and Delta DAS or DAS 28 CRP less than 3.2 to uh, appease the uh, European medicines agencies. And I was uh, second author on this paper with Dr. Smolin. So again, what you see here uh, is that the patients continuing methotrexate, their ACR20 response was 41%, and the two different doses, upadacitinib, were statistically different from continuing methotrexate alone uh, the percent of patients in low disease activity is uh, demonstrated by DAS CRP, also was statistically superior. Uh, looking at uh, another study, which was uh, patients who were conventional synth uh, synthetic DMARD incomplete responders. Again, you can see uh, 
the ACR uh, 20 response and uh, low disease activity again and again you can see the dupatacitinib was quite effective. You look at the rate of the response and one thing that's very nice with the JAK inhibitors, it's a rapid response as we've seen with other biologics. If your patient hasn't shown some type of clinical response within just uh, uh, two to four weeks, it's unlikely they're going to have a good response to these drugs. And generally, my, my feeling is by eight weeks, if they haven't responded, uh, I'm moving on. And then we also saw a study uh, presented uh, this uh, Sunday, uh, which looked at um, placebo, uh, upadacitinib, 15 milligrams in green, and adalimumab, 40 milligrams every other week in red, and methotrexate incomplete responder patients. And again, you can see the difference uh, from gray and the active treated patients. And both the uh, upadacitinib, 15 milligrams, and adalimumab were statistically superior to placebo. But you can also see that in several of these measurements, upadacitinib was superior to adalimumab, which is uh, quite exciting. And now we've seen that with baricitinib, and we've seen that with uh, upadacitinib, and certainly may uh, inform us moving forward in how we uh, manage our patients and, with and No, price. this is combined with methotrexate. Combined with methotrexate. So really not taking, uh, detracting from adalimumab. Right, no, so this was a, this was a ev ev even playing field. This wasn't gigging the system yeah. like we've done before, taking on adalimumab as monotherapy. Right. Can't trust us, you know that. So this is uh, uh, the data that was presented at this meeting that Mark Genovese uh, presented. Uh, and this is, uh, we'll talk about the Finch 2. Uh, Finch 3 and Finch 1 have not yet read out, and those were the typical studies, methotrexate IR, early rheumatoid arthritis. But what Mark presented at this meeting was the uh, biologic DMARD incomplete responders on background conventional synthetic uh, DMARDs. Uh, this was the study design uh, where patients were either placed on placebo or the two doses of filgotinib that have been studied, 100 milligram daily and 200 milligrams daily. Uh, primary endpoint at week 12 uh, was the ACR20. And what he showed uh, in this uh, uh, graph here, again, was statistically significant difference for both the 100 and 200 milligram dose for ACR 20, 50, and 70, both at 12 and 24 weeks uh, with the typically robust responses that we've seen with biologics as well as JAK inhibitors. He did a sub-analysis uh, looking, um, or these, actually, I'm sorry, these are the 12 week and 24 week uh, uh, DAS uh, low disease activity, disease remission 12 and 24 weeks. And again, you can see the trends for the grass and the uh, Asterisk here for statistically significant difference, and it achieves statistically significant difference. Uh, this was looked at prior biologic DMARDs. Some of the older data from back in the day when we uh, looked at rituxan and abatacept after TNF IRs, there was some question that the uh, improvement rate fell off the more biologics you, you felt, but failed. So the actual numbers were less, but the delta was pretty much the same. But here, uh, Mark did. Uh, demonstrated that regardless of the number of uh, biologic DMARDs you failed, you still could have a very good uh, clinical response. Can I uh, ask yes. you a few questions? Uh, it seems uh, that thus far in this, uh, in this meeting, I mean, as everybody knows, this was just a big kinase meeting. I right. just uh, can't even keep up with uh, as many abstracts. But there's a, a kind of a formulaic approach to these drug developments. There's a lot of symmetry between these programs. Um, could you embellish just a little bit on the head-to-head -head, um, early monotherapy data from these drugs as far as we know it? Because I think it's sure. really important. Yeah, I think it is important. So uh, there was a head-to-head -head study in uh, methotrexate naive patients with uh, tofacitinib, uh, and uh, their primary outcome was uh, ACR50 plus uh, modification of structure. And they achieved that. They said superior outcomes to methotrexate uh, with tofacitinib, um, as well as better structure uh, retardation, uh, which was exciting. Uh, baricitinib did the same study. And uh, they showed that the um, four milligram dose plus methotrexate was superior to methotrexate alone, uh, both for signs and symptoms and structure, whereas the four milligram dose was not uh, different as far as structure, but was for signs and symptoms. And so um, 
I'm, I have been helping just a tad with the generation of the new RA recommendations for the ACRs putting together. And I'm hopeful that we got in there one, you know, what they do is they develop the questions they want to address. And one question I asked them to address and at least put in the document, is there evidence that uh, JAK inhibitors and biologics m are more effective than methotrexate in early rheumatoid arthritis? So at least they have to opine on that and might help us dealing with third party payers in the future if we want to maybe use these drugs earlier in the paradigm. I mean, I, I think that these uh, types of studies are so important, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm not saying this in a, a, a globally endorsing way, but I mean, you know, for the first time uh, in our professional careers, we have an oral therapy that beats up methotrexate and beats it up pretty good. This is at the extreme endpoints. This is, wasn't statistically significant and clinically trivial. These right. are. Uh, meaningful and palpable uh, uh, changes. So, you know, it begs the question, just like you say, that's a, that's a PICO question? You're, right, you're, PICO you're, question, exactly. PICO question. Um, you know, so what are, the, what are the, uh, the roadblocks and what are the concerns? So the roadblocks are obviously there's a pharmacoeconomic uh, issue here of uh, a tried and true uh, drug, uh, um, which is uh, considerably cheaper, um, and uh, uh, newer drugs uh, that are considerably more expensive. Second is, you know, where w should abundance of caution uh, be uh, uh, exercised in uh, drugs for early disease where you may be giving them for 10 or 20 uh, years? So, I mean, I, I, I think at least that's a really good uh, uh, question to, right. to, to tackle. Right. And as we think about it, you know, uh, today, and we'll be talking transitioning to quality of life. You know, 10 years ago, we didn't talk about methotrexate intolerance. We didn't talk about th these things. You were either uh, a methotrexate candidate or you weren't a methotrexate candidate. You had fatty liver, or your lung disease, or you didn't drink or something like that. Today, now we have a, this kind of, um, you know, diminishing curve here of, uh, of uh, people who, uh, you know, may prefer not to take this. So I, th I think it just adds. Uh, oh, I agree 100 percent. So I did misspoke. It was ACR 70 and uh, structure retardation for the tofacitinib and pro profile and protocol. So I want to get that uh, clear. But I mean, you know, it's, it is very interesting because you know, we know from multiple clinical trial data sets that methotrexate works very well in 30 percent of patients. It's the other two thirds of patients it doesn't work on. We know from Jim O'Dell and others, Larry Moore and the tear data that six month delay did not make significant difference at two years in patient outcomes compared to a tenor set. So it's going to be a, an interesting discussion uh, moving forward to, as we have these greater development of these targeted immunomodulators. So let's talk about uh, the, if you find some questions there you want to interrupt, go ahead. Uh, we can also, also save them for them. Okay, that's actually, why don't we just like, uh, just take a little pause. Take here a little break a here. here. Uh, okay, this is your favorite question. Did the PKPD translate to any clinical differences? Uh, I don't know, except there are some differences. I mean, um, if the four milligram dose of baricitinib had come on the market in North America, we do know it's excreted renally and you need to cut the dose to two. Uh, so that would have been, uh, you know, one issue. Uh, clearly, uh, three of the jacks are metabolized by, partially at least, by the cytochrome P450 system. So, you, you know, we're now, you tell me since you're the person to ask, I assume that rifampin has gone way up in the totem pole for the treatment of latent TB compared to INH. It's quicker. Yeah. So uh, we'll probably be using more rifampin, and that could be a sticky wicket uh, in patients on these uh, JAK inhibitors. And actually, if you read the um, package insert for the approved JAK inhibitors, it says do not use rifampin in this population of patients. So there are subtle differences. Um, they all work very quickly. They have a rapid onset of action. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, as far as clinical efficacy, to me, uh, we saw a very strong uh, data set which really doesn't differentiate. We do not have head-to-head -head studies yet with these therapies. Uh, I don't know if we ever will, but it remains to be seen. A little bit of methotrexate blowback here. Would, uh, does perenteral methotrexate uh, fare up better than... Would it do any better? I mean, we don't know, actually. But well, no, we have, you know. I mean, not in. Hit, the no, yeah, we don't have any idea here. We, we know from Jorgen Braun's work that you can get about another 10 or 15 percent 
ACR20 response with sub-Q methotrexate in people who are on oral methotrexate and not having that response, you know, clearly from uh, GI toxicity, possibly stomatitis, we all know it might be a little safer. Uh, but no, I don't think with the interaction with these. And there's no drug-drug interaction between methotrexate and these drugs. Some comment uh, uh, about whether it was statistically powered to compare to adalimumab plus methotrexate versus UPA and methotrexate. And uh, th those statistical comparisons to everything but radiographic uh, was uh, uh, virtually all of them were superior for UPA plus methotrexate. Yep. Um, it was uh, 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 the radiographic changes between the two are so minuscule, it, 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 it's, right. it's hard to say anything, but it, numerically uh, to the advantage of the TNF inhibitor as almost always. Uh, some of these are, um, oh, and uh, th uh, all you people that are watching online, um, uh, uh, thanks for throwing in here. I'll ask one more question, because several of these are now talking about toxicity, which we're moving into, but right. uh, is there any way to predict response to JEX? <laughs> about as good as we can predict the response to anything else. Okay. I mean, one of the, the greatest disappointments of my career, uh, and I'm sure many others, is we have, there has been a tremendous amount of time and effort and actually dollars thrown at coming up with treatment biomarkers. And uh, I, we have failed to date. I think just now, some of the presentations here looking at other diseases like the Scott trial and others, looking at some genetic analysis, suggesting that we may just be on the cusp of maybe being able to look at treatment responses, but to date, other than the presence of seropositivity in patients on rituxan or abatacept, we really don't have anything that can uh, uh, give us some insight into how a patient is going to respond. So uh, let's move on and, and talk a little bit about safety, because um, that is really the, the message to me and most of my work with these JAK inhibitors, other than just working with the clinical trials, has been my interest in safety. These therapies have a very narrow therapeutic window. And there's a very narrow safety dose range. And you see that with pretty much all of the molecules. There's always a trend for higher adverse events uh, with the higher doses studied. And the higher doses may be a little bit better than what we have. But uh, we have to be cognizant of that because, again, you're in inhibiting multiple cytokines. So these are the side effects uh, of adverse events of interest. Uh, we'll talk about these in uh, uh, some detail. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, GI perforations. They do occur very small. The rate's about 0.1 um, for 100 patient years followed. Uh, and similar to what you see with the IL-6 inhibitors, you would think this might be the case because you're inhibiting JAK1 where IL-6 signals through. So this was a, a slide that we used at, uh, I was actually helped uh, the FDA advisory board for tofacitinib. And um, uh, what we're looking at uh, here uh, in the uh, blue circle is five milligrams of tofacitinib and the black box, uh, the 10 milligram tofacitinib. These are the phase three clinical trials. Uh, these are published uh, RCT data, so not head-to-head -head comparisons, again, indirect. And when you look across here at all-cause mortality, serious infectious episodes, malignancy, lymphoma, lung cancer, MI, perforation, and herpes zoster, all of these findings with the 5 and 10 milligram dose are similar to what we had previously acknowledged with biologic therapies. So the rate of serious infections was uh, at that time about 3 per 100 patient years. The one outlier, which we now know, is herpes zoster. Uh, we don't know the exact mechanism of action, but presumably due to uh, blocking type 1 interferons, antiviral interferons, and possibly a role of inhibiting uh, or downregulating NK cells. This is follow-up data, which I presented on Sunday, looking at uh, uh, 22,875 patient years, over 7,000 uh, patients who we followed in a long-term extension study, and many of them who participated in the early phase studies. Here is the uh, answer, 2.5 per 100 patient years for serious infectious episodes, which is similar to what we've seen with biologics. And looking at six-month uh, periods of time, there was no increase in the rate and this actually mirrors old data that we actually published years and years ago uh, with the tenor set. But it's important to look at uh, what uh, drives the risk for serious infectious episodes. So we did that. This is a forest plot looking at the hazards ratio. And just to point out to you, 
This anything uh, over here is, favors the higher dose. So this was the higher dose of tofacitinib, had a greater rate of serious infectious episodes. We well know from all data sets and observational studies, older patients have a higher risk. There was some geographic risk with Asia and New Zealand and the rest of the world having more infections than U.S. and Canada. Uh, methotrexate actually did not read out here as combination therapy is an increased risk, so it's not shown here. We've shown in every data set that I know for the last 40 years that glucocorticoids at varying doses increase the risk, and baseline diabetes and COPD increase the risk of serious infectious episodes. So defining populations of patients we might have concerns about uh, using some of these JAK inhibitors in these patients. Now, this is the Zoster data, and again, you can see 3.6 per 100 patient years. Uh, and again, no increase in rate over time. Uh, we know that with biologics, the rate, Lincoln, correct me if I'm wrong, but somewhere between 1.5 and 2 per 100 patient years uh, with biologics, so definitely increased. And this is uh, basically the tofacitinib data. Uh, baricitinib uh, has uh, presented uh, some of their long-term safety data. Again, Mark Genovese presented that at this meeting. They have about 7,000 patient years. This is actually data from last year. But point out to you again, there is a zoster signal uh, with um, uh, baricitinib, uh, looking at the two and four milligram dose, and actually looking at the final column, which is all baricitinib, 3.2%, compared to the placebo, 1%. Uh, there was another issue that was raised in the baricitinib developed program, which has put a cloud over all of the JAK inhibitors at this point, and that was this um, concern here. And the placebo-controlled portion of the baricitinib development program, there were six patients who developed uh, DVTs or pulmonary embolism compared to none on placebo. So there was an imbalance. Now the problem here is that because of um, ICH guidelines and how we do clinical trials, it's, it's greatly different from when I was young and we used to have people on placebo for a year, which was the wrong thing to do. Placebo portions of trials are now 12 to 16 weeks with rescue allowed. So you have a very short placebo duration to really help you define your safety signal. So this raised a, a great deal of angst. And uh, if you want some good late night reading, go read the FDA briefing document for the baricitinib advisory meeting. It's um, full of uh, uh, descriptive terminology and, and scary uh, things that uh, make you wonder what people were thinking about. But the bottom line, there was concern by the FDA that there was not substantial data to show that the two milligram do the four milligram dose was better than the two milligram dose. Only the two milligram dose was only studied in two of the five phase three studies. So even though the sponsor made a strong argument that four milligram dose in certain patients was better than the two milligram, the FDA was concerned about this signal of DVT and PE and did not approve the four milligram dose in this country. Just to show you for perspective, this is uh, data that was presented at this meeting, looking at claims-based data, looking at the rate of uh, DVTs and uh, PEs, and again, the rate for baricitinib fell well within the published rates, previous clinical trials, and these uh, uh, claims-based data when they looked at their whole program. Uh, so we do not know the mechanism of action of this. Baricitinib is the one jack and nib where platelet counts don't go down. Platelets or acute phase reactants generally go down. It didn't in the, uh, this program, but there were patients who had DVTs and PEs who had normal platelet counts and some who were elevated. So uh, the, again, if you read this late night reading that I'm suggesting, the FDA opined on how they thought this could be occurring, but uh, it's all theoretical. This is uh, just a one snippet of upadacitinib data from the short-term clinical trial. Uh, we don't have long-term safety data yet available in the public domain. And again, uh, there is this um, zoster signal uh, that you see. Uh, and, uh, you know, there has been some, in other studies, some slightly higher transaminase uh, issue. We see elevated LFTs with these JAK inhibitors. It's much more common in people who are on methotrexate with the JAK inhibitor, and it's what we're used to in practice, and we know how to manage this. Originally, there was some concern about venous thromboembolism seeing, being seen primarily in the UPA group, not placebo, but the more recent clinical trials presented this meeting show a similar distribution of the uh, DVTs and PEs. 
Uh, looking at uh, the uh, Finch 2 data that uh, Mark Genovese presented, again, you see a zoster signal uh, here, uh, you know, and again, uh, not much difference in serious infections here and so forth, and uh, you see one DVTP on uh, filgotinib. They have presented their Darwin 3 data in a poster today, looking at 132 weeks of filgotinib. Uh, the safety <laughs> profile looks very similar to me to uh, other uh, JAK inhibitors, um, and um, we look forward to the safety database from their large phase three trials, which we'll be reading out uh, shortly. Do you have any questions on there before we go to the labs? Uh, no, I think we'll, we'll just do the whole safety and then we'll, okay. we'll kind of talk. Uh, okay. So again, laboratory changes seen with the JAK inhibitors. Uh, uh, we talked about the LFT elevations. Uh, most of these are generally modest and easily manageable and resolved with discontinuation of treatment. Uh, and for the lipids, there generally has been an increase in HDL and LDL. The ratio remains unchanged. We don't really, Filgotinib, the early data suggested that uh, the HDL went up, but the LDL didn't. But looking at the poster today, it looked like the ratio went up, but we'll answer that question when they uh, present their phase three data. We don't want to reduce JAK2 or impact JAK2, because that's where you get your anemias, and that was a major concern early in the development program. There rarely are patients who have substantial drops in hemoglobin with uh, these JAK inhibitors. It certainly needs to be in your differential diagnosis when a patient comes in with anemia, but it is unusual with these therapies. Uh, reducing neutrophil counts is part of the MOA, a mechanism of action of these therapies. Generally, it's modest like we see with other biologics. Uh, rarely it can be more profound. Again, uh, dose reduction or discontinuation will take care of this. Lymphocytes rarely is seen uh, lymphopenia. We know with tofacitinib uh, that uh, that was associated with increased risk of serious infectious episodes. It's been seen, been seen sporadically in the other development programs. We don't understand this very small increase in serum creatinine. It seems to go up not only with the JAK inhibitors, but other kinase inhibitors that we're looking at databases. It, uh, we're not seeing renal insufficiency develop in these patients, uh, so it's an interesting observation with reduction in inflammation, a small increase in serum creatinine. Uh, this is a table put together by Kevin Winthrop in uh, Nature Reviews Rheumatology from about a year ago, uh, comparing uh, uh, the different uh, JAK inhibs and their laboratory findings. And uh, they, actually, the, the arrows in general are, are very similar. Uh, there were a few differences, no change in platelet count, like I mentioned with baricitinib. Uh, lymphocyte numbers were minimally impacted by baricitinib and filgotinib. And uh, filgotinib is the only JAK inhibitor that I'm aware of that doesn't seem to have an impact on uh, NK cells based on the data they presented so far. Uh, it's interesting, we see this with any early development. CPK elevation is commonly seen in early clinical trials. It's probably just spurious and background noise with exercise, but we see that in almost we have a phase one unit where we do phase one studies on multiple different uh, molecules, and CPK elevation is a common phenomenon that's almost never clinically important. So that's um, the labs, Lenny. Before okay. if you want to go into the zoster story, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, there's a lot of questions on zoster, so let's let's kind of uh, move along. And uh, so. What we have seen um, uh, uh, in the kinase era is uh, what Stan has shown, that there's a signal. So why do we worry about it? We worry about it for several reasons. One, um, anybody that takes care of somebody with shingles, and there will be a lot of people in here that have had shingles, this is an ignominious disease. Um, even it's in its simple and self-limited form, it's very painful, costs a lot of money to take care of, a lot of uh, missed work time. Um, in a considerable percentage, depending upon how you define it, uh, the leading complication uh, is post herpetic neuropathy. The leading risk factor is age for that. Young people virtually never get it. And that is, uh, as you know, there's no treatment uh, for it other than palliation, and it can last uh, a long time. So that being bad enough, more recent work uh, has shown, uh, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll show a, a study that uh, we published uh, last year with uh, Jeff Curtis's uh, group, uh, which uh, has built on an observation that is now canon. There are now uh, uh, well over, I, I, I lost track, I, at a dozen studies that have verified that if you have herpes zoster, 
um, your chances of stroke um, is significantly in increased, particularly early, fades after a number of months, but may persist to a year. There are some risk factors. If you have head and neck herpes, uh, zoster, uh, zoster optomicus, it's greatest, but even having uh, um, lumbosacral uh, herpes will increase this risk. So we're framing this now in a question like, okay, if we're in the business of making herpes zoster, then we should take note of this. And then the question is, uh, does prompt therapy reduce these cardiovascular risks? And there are also some studies that suggest that MI is actually uh, increased in the uh, short window as well. Um, prompt therapy um, uh, 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 may attenuate these risks. And then what about uh, the effect of uh, prevention with vaccines? So um, that is currently the question. Now, if you've seen data on the kinase inhibitors, uh, I mean, we know tons about TOFA, and maybe that will be the leader in the incidence, and, and perhaps because it seems to be a little more pan jacked than others, has that jack 3 which may not mean something, but it may mean something. That's common gamma chain that affects NK cells. Um, maybe that filgotinib uh, ex vivo uh, takes a light touch to that. Maybe the rates will be different. We don't know because we don't have the numbers yet, but we're keeping an eye on the long-term issues of all of these things. So that presents to us um, uh, uh, an opportunity um, to, um, uh, you know, intervene. So varicella vaccine is for somebody that's never had an uh, infection. Um, and that's uh, still the vaccine of choice for people that have never been exposed to, var to varicella. Uh, Zostavax is a vaccine that we've had for quite a long time. And as everybody knows, it is a live vaccine. And the ACIP has promulgated uh, that it is not to be used in patients on biologic therapy or high-dose glucocorticoids or high-dose immunosuppression. So that always gave us pause of what, what do we do? You have patients on stable therapy, and they gave us windows of what was safe and what is not safe here. Um, and uh, uh, there have been various attempts to uh, do this in a more realistic uh, way. I see Dr. Lindsay over here, and maybe he can comment with us a little bit later about some of his wonderful uh, work in uh, real life evaluation of this vaccine. Um, the vaccine uh, is effective, but not highly effective. Uh, pivotal trial by Michael Oxman, 36,000 patients, 50% protection over the first couple of years, 66% protection against post-herpetic neuralgia, but the older you get, the less good it works. Enter Shingrix, uh, the complex herpes zoster subunit vaccine that has now been recently approved, two doses separated um, uh, by several months. This is a complex vaccine. Uh, it's killed vaccine, so we don't have to worry about it, uh, this reactivation. Um, it's highly effective, 97% uh, infection uh, control, regardless of age. Um, it is different because it is heavily adjuvenated in a complex uh, 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 lipid protein system. And uh, people in here that are giving it, you know, from time to time patients, 15% uh, uh, of people can have grade two or more toxicities. It usually lasts a few days, uh, but they can be bad. Uh, as uh, the other trials, uh, they censored patients with active immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. So despite what the company who makes this says, we don't really know much about their use in our patients with serious rheumatic diseases on immunosuppressive therapy. It's just a fact of life. So, you know, where, where are we going here? So that is now the preferred vaccine. It is uh, ACIP endorsed for people over the age of 50. Um, uh, it can be given uh, uh, while you're on a biologic, not biologic, we don't know about the effects right now. Um, uh, some of us have an abundance of caution with it. Uh, many of us are, are starting to use this. I believe that people on kinase inhibitors, I encourage every single person to be vaccinated. And up until Shingrix, uh, I've, uh, I have counseled that I favor Zostavax, regardless of age. I'm worried about the cardiovascular risks and the strokes. 
Shingrix, I, I am uh, still a work in progress uh, with me. I'm, I'm waiting for uh, uh, a little bit of observation. I've given it to a number of patients uh, in this space. Um, uh, there's a little shortage of the vaccine right now, so the second immunization is kind of tough to get. Uh, I don't know if we're geared up here. Let's take a poll. Uh, who is recommended in rheumatoid arthritis patients on any kind of therapy, um, uh, Shingrix thus far in your practice? Raise of hands. What do you think that's? 20%? No, it's more than that. Okay. Raise of middle hand. Right, okay. I don't know. I, well, some of these people may not be physicians here, so you're going to remember that. Okay, we have to. Oh, stand, I don't want you to be Trumpism. Stand no such Trumpism a, here. That's fake news. Fake news. Right, so. I didn't ask how many physicians. I asked how many people have you have given. Prescribe it. All right. Oh, that's very good. Um, so stand, what are you doing in your practice? Well, I'm, before I do that, someone just has a question. Uh, should varus helotitis be checked after Shingrix? No, no, absolutely. That, that's an easy question. The, while, we, uh, while we really kind of uh, cogitate over uh, moving antibody titers and memory cells, there is no uh, high, uh, uh, highly predictive biomarker that correlates uh, with enduring immunity. Uh, we measure it because it's the best we can do, but we don't. Um, we don't need to check. Uh, well, there's no recommendation to check varicella titers beforehand either. Uh, but if you did know that a patient did not have this, you're really recommended to give varicella virus uh, first. This is not the, the vaccine for chickenpox. Uh, this is a much more potent uh, adjunct. Okay. Other questions in here? Well, which zoster vaccine do you recommend? You've already opined on that. And um, is, what, do we, what do you know about the mechanisms of zoster-associated stroke and MI? before we move on. We don't know anything about the uh, mechanism uh, of it uh, per se. The work of uh, Dr. Gilden and his colleagues uh, show that uh, it is angiotropic virus, can be found in large vessels. Um, that we know that it can transmigrate to the brain. Uh, this is his kind of uh, 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 life theory. Uh, not all people have been able to duplicate this, but uh, it's something along this way. Up here, I want to ask Dr. Lindsay what he's doing. He's a, been a leading guy right up on this table over here. What are you doing in the Shingrix era? So we're giving it, but uh, not to anybody with active RA. So if they're active, I'm too concerned uh, about exacerbating the flare. So I'd, I'd rather give it uh, when somebody's in low disease activity because you got your whole life to do this one vaccine twice. And the same thing, I feel the same thing about Prevnar, is that let's give it at a, at a right time. And what I don't know is whether we should hold uh, methotrexate. So I'm actually holding methotrexate for two weeks at the time I give the Shingrix each time, as well as I hold it when I give the uh, flu, flu vaccine. That's so, I mean, that's just a thought, just trying to, uh, to maximize the, the time. And, and uh, what Steve's talking about is certainly the uh, uh, more recent data on uh, a two-week peri-vaccine uh, vacation from methotrexate, which is really quite safe and uh, seems to have a, a high effect size. So I, this is really a work in progress. And uh, you know what we really need is a, a significantly powered study that asks the critical questions across IMIDs. Uh, does this heavily adjuvenated vaccine, when given to people, uh, who are vulnerable, particularly people who have signature autoantibodies. Does it change their autoantibodies? Does it change their disease activity? What's the safety signal? And uh, you know, we, we, we just need that. And uh, it's not forthcoming right now. There's nothing at this meeting, so I'm, I'm, I'm done. So this is the, va this is the, uh, the vaccine recommendations of uh, two doses, two to six months apart, over the age of 50. Um, we don't, uh, it, even if you've had Shingrix in the past, it's recommended to give, uh, or not, if you've had Zostavax in the past, recommended to revaccinate uh, with Shingrix after a, a pause of uh, at least a, a year or more. Um, and uh, but we don't have to worry about the reactivation to, the, in the TOFA program and all that kind of stuff. So I think that that's uh, pretty straightforward. So? This is your baby. I have the con. All right, very good. So we're going to wind up here in the last uh, uh, little bit here about talking about uh, 
PROs in, 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 in clinical trials, but I'm going to turn this to talk about PROs in practice as well. And the Sesterol PROs is a measure of value of new therapeutics and RA. Uh, in addition to all the things that uh, have been talked about, uh, you know, total sharp scores, and combined disease activity, and um, uh, uh, you know, minimal uh, uh, functional things such as HAC DI. Uh, I will say this at the outset here. Uh, well, I'm going to ask a question. How often do you assess PROs in follow-up visits of patients? I don't care. It's got to be any kind of PRO. It could be rapid, hack di uh, if you're using something uh, more robust, promise scales, et cetera. All right, so answer, 0 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90. Okay, I think that that's uh, reasonable um, uh, and not what I would uh, not unexpect. Uh, uh, we're going to do a little bit of case here. So we have a 36-year-old female with RA who's been receiving a TNF inhibitor plus methotrexate for three months. At her follow-up appointment, she has a rapid 3 of 5.9, not good, and complaints of fatigue. Upon joint exam, she has five tender and three swollen. She also has noted she does not like to receive injections, and they are inconvenient for her busy lifestyle. She doesn't like them. Which of the following would be a reasonable next step in managing her? Continue the regimen for uh, another month. Now she's, you know, you're three months into this, um, and reassess. Switch to another biologic with a different MOA. Switch from the TNF to a JAK. Uh, inhibitor, switch the regimen to monotherapy with a JAK inhibitor. So now she's on a combination. What the dose of, uh, of uh, methotrexate is, uh, you can put in your head, whatever you'd like. All right, so let's answer this question here. All right, so 60-70% um, would go in that direction. So it's an interesting uh, matrix. So. Um, Let's turn and talk a little bit about um, uh, PROs, uh, that is patient reported outcome measures. Uh, uh, they're collected from questionnaires, they're from the patient. So I, I'd like to just kind of set this up before we go into the granularity of it. I predict that PROs in rheumatology, this is a disruptive force in, in our um, area. So for, for decades we have relied on combined disease activity measures um, and if you look at the guidelines, we have a, a short list of these things. Most of them all tell us the same thing. At this meeting, because uh, I'm interested in it, I did some searches of quality of life, PROs, and promise scores. And there are just hundreds and hundreds uh, of uh, reports. And not only are there reports of them used in clinical trials, but how do you incorporate them into practice. And I think that the reason for that is, is that uh, there's been recent trends in the literature that we'll come up with that have clearly identified that there are gaps between what the docs have been interested in, total sharp scores, which the patient never has heard of, um, and what the patients are interested in. I don't feel good. I'm tired. I can't sleep. I'm whatever. And so this is, an op this is both a threat to disrupt the way that we practice. I don't have time for this. Or can we seamlessly um, uh, acquire this data and do good by the patient to increase their satisfaction, increase their empowerment, uh, and perhaps increase their adherence to the medicine that we're trying to give them. So I, I'm throwing that out. So ex examples of this. The ACR core measures are up here. There's all, a number of things for physical function, um, uh, uh, which are largely about hack. Uh, pain may be as easy as a visual analog scale, but there are other scales for this. Global assessments. Uh, can be done in, uh, 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 we get data from people about how's your health um, and how is it defined. Wording is very important in these. Uh, potential core measure candidates are, are listed up here of fatigue, stiffness, and flares. We still don't have a good uh, flare uh, 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 metric. Um, there are multidimensional uh, disease activities that we have relied on in uh, the the past generation, and then there is the new generation uh, of uh, metrics. 
you know, uh, are we uh, concerned about sleep? You know, sleep is actually quite important in the immune system. Lack of sleep drives inflammation. Inflammation drives lack of sleep. So there's a countervailing force there. Mood. You know, we talk about it so often. You know, oh, fibro patients have uh, 30 to 40 percent major mood disorder. Imids have uh, 20 percent major mood disorder, faster th or greater than control populations. What are we doing to collect that data? Can be easily done within a, a, a minute or two with a, a, with a PRO. And finally, what about work, functionality? So um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, 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 promise scores as we go along, uh, but you own these, uh, at least if you're a U.S. taxpayer, paid for with $180 million of your tax money, Stan. So you're I'm welcome. using your promise scores. You're welcome. All right. So uh, here's some data to just take a look at uh, what we are seeing. So first of all, it's about 17 to 20 percent of, uh, of clinical trials are collecting meaningful data on some of the more recent domains, such as uh, fatigue, uh, even less so with sleep. Uh, we've been pretty good with pain because they're in our core measures. So here's a 24-month um, uh, uh, tofacitinib from oral start. So you have comparator group here of methotrexate versus tofa at two different doses. And what are you seeing here? Um, you're seeing patient global assessments change. So methotrexate is moving this, um, you know, uh, 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 26 uh, 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 on a, uh, uh, a, a 10, uh, uh, 100 uh, 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 analog scale. Uh, same for pain. Um, of uh, 29, uh, HACDI moving decently at 0.7, and SF36, seven uh, 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 points. I'll talk about what these actually points mean. If you look at TOFA now, they're numerically superior, they're statistically superior at 34, 34, HAC greater than uh, uh, 0.9, and SF36 of 11, and uh, uh, TOFA 10, which we don't use uh, 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 numerically uh, impressive as well. So whenever you're looking at PROs, the first thing you're going to ask yourself, what do these numbers mean? Is that good? Is uh, moving 29? I mean, I know that having no tender joints is good, but is moving 10 on a visual analog scale good? Uh, uh, so we're, we're in a learning process, and what we do know for many of these things, such as pain and fatigue, is that, you know, uh, we have a minimally important difference. And for each one of these scales, they're different, and I often have to go look to remember what's going on. But in the SF36, changing by 2.5 to 5 points is meaningful. That means people actually know that their lives are better when, when you see these type of data. Um, uh, we know that uh, 0.32 for HAC is considered minimally important difference, and uh, these are larger. But does m moving uh, TOFA uh, uh, up on the pain scale, five points over pain, uh, that may be uh, important to the patient. Um, and when we look at uh, other metrics, uh, it, they come similarly. Here's a, 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 a BERA study, again, comparing to methotrexate. What are you seeing here? You got that little guy here, so we have, um, you could do that one. I'll go over here, I'll be yep. parsimonious. Um, here we have uh, patient uh, global assessment. Um, uh, the JAK inhibitor, uh, uh, statistically and with a uh, minim meaningful change, um, uh, their uh, 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 global activity uh, is improved. Um, pain uh, f on behalf of the patient, uh, nearly a 10-point spread, which is uh, uh, meaningful to patients and, and uh, we uh, understand that, and uh, we can look at something. Here's a uh, delta for morning stiffness. So I'm just giving a couple opportunities uh, to take a look at, at these um, in uh, comparator limbs. So again, methotrexate, the, the stalwart of our, our, of our drug, we've talked about it, saying um, all the JAK inhibitors that have compared head-to-head -head with methotrexate have beat it in combined disease activity measures um, uh, and extreme uh, measures. What do they do to quality of life? Uh, well, you can see that uh, it improves uh, uh, HAC DI uh, palpably, nearly a double improvement. And I think that this is very meaningful to me 
and seeing a swing of pain of somewhere between 10 and 20 points uh, over the standard bearer. You know, you can say, oh, uh, there's a change. To a patient, we know that uh, moving uh, 20 points on a visual analog pain scale is moderate to high, um, and uh, uh, this is what they are telling us. Um, Morning stiffness um, and uh, global assessments uh, as well. And if you look at uh, the physical component um, of uh, the SF36, which has multiple domains, um, uh, these are measurements all between 4 and 10, all meaningful from the uh, perspective uh, of the patient. Here we have uh, uh, the Finch 2 data from uh, 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 looking at uh, two doses of filgotinib uh, versus the placebo limb. And uh, we can see that for uh, HACDI, di um, SF36 physical component, and fatigue, and fatigue, um, we are seeing uh, uh, palpable uh, improvements for fatigue, uh, uh, improvement of 2.5 to 5. In your practice, uh, I am sure it is the same as my practice, the same as Dan's practice. Uh, th this is one of the tougher issues that we have, uh, particularly in patients uh, that have, there, there are two populations that are of great interest to us. Those that we think have uh, actively controlled disease that are still fatigued, we have to look for other dimensions. These people want to be well. We may be able to um, uh, uh, help them in ways if we examine uh, their exercise or their mood. Um, and then also people um, who have poorly controlled disease and, and big time uh, uh, loss of quality of life where we have opportunity uh, to make major gains uh, with our drugs. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, uh, talk just for a second about the discordance issue. And this is a large part uh, driving our discussion of this. Um, there's some very nice work that's come out of the Mayo Clinic, uh, John Davis's group, uh, who have been uh, studying the discordant patient. So a discordant patient in their definition are, is that patient glo uh, physician global and patient global. If it's greater than 30 points off, that's discordance. In other words, looks good, feels bad, or looks bad, feels good. How often does this occur? Almost one in two visits, 40% according to their data. And uh, this intuitively, your skill, a lot of skilled clinicians here, when it does happen, is the patient saying they're doing a lot better than what you think or a lot worse than what you think? Okay, 90% of the time. And, you know, so what does this actually represent? Well, a lot of it uh, is non-rheumatic, non-disease, non-biomarker-based uh, uh, problems, which, you know, in the eye is looked at as a threat and an opportunity. The threat is, well, it's not my disease. The opportunity is that this is a patient that needs help, um, and uh, uh, we're looking to improve the quality of, of life of this. And their drilled-down data have suggested that uh, many of these patients do have widespread pain and intercurrent mood disorders. There's an article in last month's Arthritis Care and Research that did a qualitative analysis of interviewing these patients. And the title of the article was, Like No One Is Listening to Me. And I thought this was one of the most brilliant articles that uh, has been written and published in that journal in a long time. And it really, uh, 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 in a qualitative uh, uh, fashion, um, analyzed that um, within a few minutes, uh, using empathy and advanced communication skills, we can often uh, make people feel better about what's going on uh, without having to solve their problem. They're just knowing that, uh, that you're not telling them that there's something that's in their head and their disease is great and get out of here. So I think this is a disruptor. Uh, we, we have to rethink this uh, a, a little bit in how we're uh, approaching patients. Uh, but we put on a fellows program for 60 uh, uh, rheumatology fellows where we just focused on this. Um, and the feedback has been uh, extraordinary uh, that uh, uh, this adds another dimension, another tool in the toolbox. So uh, I'm happy to uh, in engage with this. So before we finish up. Is our thing here. Yeah, let's go through some of the questions. Sure. Uh, we'll get back.
So uh, we have a question about how often you monitor laboratory and patients on these jaconids. Well, we know that uh, the recommendations uh, for the approved jaconids is every three months uh, to monitor uh, labs. And uh, we know that at least with um, tofacitinib, I don't know, the Berry data is newer, 40% of people are on monotherapy, which means 60% of the patients are on conventional synthetic DMARDs, so we're already monitoring lab on those people uh, every 8 to 12 weeks. Another question about what do you do when someone is going to elective surgery? Well, there is zero evidence, but we, t but we have a guidelines document from the college which suggests that you hold uh, at least tofacitinib, that when they published the guidelines, baricitinib was not approved. They suggested seven days, but it's basically not based on any information. We know that the half-life is so short with these drugs, they're gone, but the reality is the biological half-life is much longer, so it's really unclear how often um, uh, do you, uh, how long do you, do you go off these drugs? Um, someone wanted to address the notion of convenience. Would patients uh, want to switch from an injection every two weeks to a drug they take every day? And I guess the, the science experiment will be uh, completed in a few years. We'll know if they're willing to do that or not. Uh, what do we know about uh, adherence to oral kinase inhibitors? Uh, what, 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 are, what are the data thus far? I, I you know, the, the adherence uh, in general, I, I, I can only speak to one poster we had here looking at uh, adherence to therapy with or without methotrexate, and it was about 70, 80 percent. You know, it's probably as good as it gets for yeah. about anything for us. One very important question is um, we're going to have uh, four jacks on the market, jack inhibitors on the market, not Janus kinases. And uh, what do we do if a patient fails one jack inhibitor? Do you switch to a second jack inhibitor? Um, there is, uh, as you know, zero data. Those studies have not been done. Um, my first thought on that, uh, living down in Dallas, was probably not. But talking to people, there makes some sense. It makes some quite a bit of sense that it may be that some of the doses that have been approved are not the maximal doses, and therefore, if you switch to something else, you might get improvement. But that again, that's the experiment we're waiting on and uh, to see. But we just um, don't know the data. I would not suggest you combine jack inhibitors. You can't do that anyway. No one's going to pay for that. Uh, but I will tell you that in early phase research, there are people interested in combining jacks with other mechanisms of action, and those of us who are old enough to be around with a tenorcep and anakinra and a tenorcep and a vatacep have some concerns about that, but certainly we need to do something for that, whatever that percentage of patients we have are actually uh, refractory. So what do you, do? if a patient gets zoster, Lynn, uh, when do they need to be vaccinated? They, I mean, they need to be vaccinated right after that zoster event, yeah. or, or do they wait because their immune system is so revved up at that point there's no rush to uh, vaccinate them. There is an, uh, uh, the biologic phenomena of endogenous uh, vaccination. So all the things that you would be measuring as surrogates will rise. Your antibody level will rise. Your effector cell uh, population will rise. I, I asked this question to Michael Oxman uh, uh, in the uh, pre-Shingrix era, but the answer shouldn't be any different. He says he would wait a year, and that's good enough for me. So we'd wait a year. Yeah. Okay, that's very C level advice. evidence, but from the guy that owns this. Okay. That's what I've been telling my patients. Okay. And then someone asked uh, there's a question which uh, we always uh, talk about, but not usually at these sessions the cost of these drugs versus <laughs> monoclonal antibodies. And uh, these drugs uh, certainly are expensive, uh, but not to the degree of what the rate of price increase that we've seen with our other biologics especially the ones that are now there are biosimilars for. And uh, so, again, they're, they're, they are very uh, expensive. Um, someone asked a question, where will we be in 10 years as far as the therapeutic paradigm? Uh, you know, will, will these JAK inhibitors be replacing uh, the biologic therapies? And clearly we don't know, you know. So uh, certain of a be generic then. And then when that happens with a small molecule, it's going to be very interesting to see what the cost of these, these drugs will be. So I think that's the, the bulk of the questions that I see here. Someone uh, did criticize me for showing the Truven and Sentinel database and mentioning baricitinib. I was just trying to show you these were the data for uh, claims-based data as well as published data, and baricitinib for DVT and PEAS fell well within that. 
so I wasn't clear on that. But uh, that's it, I think, boss. So I guess it is time for the SMART goals. All right. Smart you want to lead us out of here? Yes. All right. So uh, jacketidinums uh, have similar efficacy to biologic DMARDs uh, and are appropriate treatments for methotrexate IR or biologic uh, DMARD uh, IR patients with RA. I think the data speak for itself. Um, I think the data support the use in DMARD naive patients. I mean, they, there is the efficacy data is unequivocal, uh, but present use is limited by insurers and governmental authorities, and and you know there is the notion of uh, abundance of caution uh, of what what the long term future use will be. So I, I think that that's uh, in play. The safety issues and uh, Stan has contributed so much to this. Uh, uh, are, are becoming uh, increasingly well delineated. I, as a, a person who's particularly interested in um, uh, rare complications and particular opportunistic infections, I don't even start getting excited until after 10,000 patient years. Now we're up to well over 20,000 patient years in the Topositinib database and nothing seems to be rattling around there and I, I look forward to um, uh, you know, increasing uh, data from that well-curated database. Uh, we talked extensively about herpes zoster, and it'll be interesting to see what uh, the comparative rates will be with these drugs as they get into many thousands of patients a year uh, follow-up. And then um, uh, lastly, uh, uh, differences in JAK specificity exist, uh, but uh, for the moment, uh, it is hard to translate that into clinical uh, 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 solid uh, recommendations, and we have a lot more to learn about that. And then lastly, I, I didn't get to put a SMART goal in about PROs. I think there's growing data to show that there's a difference between jacotinibs um, and traditional non-biologic uh, DMARDs. Um, I think that there is the, uh, this is uh, uh, likely to be highly meaningful to patients. Um, and that if, uh, you know, you start thinking about this in your head, um, these do uh, 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 potentially offer uh, an advantage in a domain uh, that is very, very important to the patients that we're now just starting to look at. I uh, like to think that uh, the next uh, meeting that the number of patient, uh, people uh, routinely collecting PROs, um, uh, uh, particularly electronically, there's so many uh, advances going on, uh, will continue to grow, and uh, this will become uh, more uh, relevant to practice. Great. That's a good wrap-up. I want to thank uh, everybody for their attention and their interest, and also the people online as well for who uh, viewed this streaming. And uh, we certainly enjoyed it, and I hope that uh, you found this of interest. Thank you for your attendance. Thanks. Thanks.